Mr. Kershaw is a New York Times best-selling author whose books include The Bedford Boys and The First Wave, which offer powerful accounts of American heroism on D-Day. Good morning. What a wonderful view. What a wonderful sight, um, especially to my left here. Uh, I would just like to say from the bottom of my heart, as a limey who has lived in this great country for 30 years now, I want to thank you gentlemen for everything, for my life. I am 58 years old and I am one of the greatest beneficiaries, as are millions, countless millions of Europeans, of your duty, courage and sacrifice. Thank you very much. Very quickly, because I was not born on these shores, I would like to thank our allies. And I would like to repeat the words of the great Ronald Reagan, who I believed made the finest speech about D-Day, stood above those perilous cliffs at Point de Hoc in 1984. The strength of America's allies is vital to the United States and the American security guarantee is essential to the continued freedom of Europe's democracies. We were with you then, we are with you now. Your hopes are our hopes and your destiny is our destiny. As I speak to you today of the 16 million Americans who served this great nation, almost 250 years old. There are less than 100,000 still breathing. Hardly any saw action on D-Day. Today, I think of the many heroes I have been honored to write about and to meet. And I also think about a remarkable American woman, Lucille Hoback Borges. She will celebrate her 95th birthday this Saturday. In 1944, she had to wait more than six weeks to find out what had happened to her brothers, Raymond and Bedford Hoback, two of the Bedford boys on D-Day. She told me that the only time she saw her father cry during her entire life was when he walked to a barn on the family's farm, having received the second of two telegrams informing him in July 1944 that he had lost both of his sons. Bedford Hobart is buried at the American cemetery at Colville Sumer, not far from where he was killed surrounded by 9,386 white crosses, perfectly aligned, headstones facing west, toward the new world, toward home. Raymond Hoback's name is inscribed on the wall of the missing in the same graveyard, alongside some 1,500 warriors whose bodies were never found. She told me, you wonder what they might have done with their lives. You never forget. I miss them every day. Most years, you can find me in Normandy. Every year, I go there. I will go there until I can no longer walk. I'll squat down again touch the sands on Omaha Beach and thank God the Allies succeeded on Dino. I'll marvel at the enormity of the greatest gift the United States has ever bestowed. For 80 years, the longest period in recorded history, the Europe set free by my heroes 
from the Allied nations has enjoyed what so many of us take so much for granted, peace and democracy. And every time I return, I'll repeat my, to myself the words inscribed on the wall of the chapel in Colville Sumer graveyard, right above Omaha Beach. Think not upon their passing. Remember the glory of their spirit. Thank you, Alex. On behalf of the friends of the National World War II Memorial and National Park Service, I welcome you to today's 80th anniversary of the D-Day commemoration at the National World War II Memorial. I'm now pleased to introduce the official party for today's commemoration. Mr. Toby Roosevelt, great-grandson of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and a member of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial Board of Directors. Rondi Elliott, Daughter of Army Corporal Frank Elliott, killed in action on June 6, 1944. From the National Park Service, Superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Parks, Mr. Jeff Reinbold. <laughs> Friends of the National World War II Memorial Board Chair, Mrs. Jane Dropa. United States Mint Director, Ms. Ventress Gibson. And from the Military District of Washington, our chaplain for today's event is Chaplain Will Horton. At this time, please rise for the presentation of colors, the playing of the United States National Anthem by the United States Marine Brass Quintet, and the invocation by Chaplain Horton.
join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we thank you for the strength of this nation that we love. We thank you for the military forces that over the years have comprehensively trained and built a proportional force to defend our nation in a time of war. A force that ethically and morally stands above all others. On this 80th anniversary of D-Day, our nation and our community commemorates the combined efforts of the American military branches and our allied forces who came together in the infamous hedgerows of Normandy. Good men and women fought for liberty, and thousands of our allied forces paid the ultimate sacrifice. The scars of that initial invasion forged the bedrock that ultimately led to the defeat of the rising tyranny of Nazi Germany. It is your presence that has also enabled us to build strong alliances between nations and leaders in order to defeat threats to democracy, human rights, and freedom. It's your merciful power that enables our coalition of military forces to defeat the darkness of that day and that every day since then we have the hope of liberty and justice for all. Help us to remember the families of those who made the ultimate sacrifice to consider their hearts and needs even more highly than our own. God bless our nation. The organizations that make this ceremony possible bless the great citizens of our United States of America and all those who strive to uphold the ideals that our nation's heroes fought to safeguard. God bless our servicemen, both men and women, both past and present, both here and around the world, and their families. And God bless America. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Before I introduce our first speaker, it is my great privilege to introduce representatives of the allied nations who participated in the D-Day invasion 80 years ago. Without this united effort and contribution, we would not enjoy the freedom we enjoy and cherish today. From the Embassy of Australia, Naval Attaché Commodore David Frost. From the Embassy of Canada, Armed Forces Assistant Military Attaché Lieutenant Colonel Martin Aran. From the Embassy of the Czech Republic, Defense Cooperation Attaché and Assistant Defense Military Naval and Air Attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Jan Novotny. From the Embassy of Denmark, Defense Attaché Rear Admiral Jakob de Rousseau. From the Embassy of France, Deputy Chief of Mission, Aurélie Bonal, and Naval Attaché, Captain John Olivier Grau. From the Embassy of Greece, Defense Attaché, Brigadier General, Lakopoulos, from the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Military Attaché, Colonel Peter Neuenhout. From the Royal Norwegian Embassy, Defense Attaché, Major General Harold Hagen. And from the Embassy of the Republic of Poland, 
Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. Adam Shibasovsky. Just as they were vital in defeating tyranny nearly eight decades ago, our allies continue to be indispensable partners in safeguarding freedom today. We are honored by your presence with us today. And now please welcome our first speaker, Friends of the National World War II Memorial Chairwoman, Mrs. Jane Gropa. podiums and took my speech. Welcome everybody. Uh, yes, we are now going to have Jeff Wendell take my place. Thank you. Way to roll with it, Jane. Appreciate that. Uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Reinbold. I'm the superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Parks. On behalf of the National Park Service, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the World War II Memorial on this, the 80th anniversary of Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, France, that marked the beginning of the liberation of Europe and foreshadowed the end of the Second World War. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our distinguished guests, members of the armed services, diplomatic corps who are with us, and most of all, our veterans, our families, and friends. We are humbled to be here with you on this day, which commemorates one of the most extraordinary days of the 20th century. I would also like to thank the friends of the National World War II Memorial, the National Park Service's partner in the care of this memorial, partner doesn't sound enough, friend, um, as well, in sponsoring today's event. It's a privilege and an honor to work with all of you and the friends to ensure that the sacrifices and accomplishments of the millions of Americans who fought that war will never be forgotten. Today we also pause to remember the Allied armies, to thank them who joined us in the battle on the beaches of Normandy, to reestablish liberty in Europe, that led, and the men who led that great crusade. They parachuted from the sky, and fought to the shores at beaches called Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword, to free a continent and to stop one of the greatest forces of evil the world has known. More than 4,000 men in the invasion force made the supreme sacrifice on the beaches and in the hedgerows of Normandy. The fallen were fathers, sons, husbands, friends. We honor their sacrifice and acknowledge the gaping hole left in the families and their communities for their loss. Those who did return were forever changed. These were young men, many of them 18, 19, and 20, who answered the call to arms and took on this awesome responsibility far beyond their years. They were the true sons and saviors of democracy. Their bravery, which still inspires awe these many years later, right about the beginning, the end of that terrible war. Today we are privileged to have with us some of those young men who are here. The passage of time has clearly not dimmed their heroism, the heroism of their deeds and the memory of their accomplishments. And we look forward to learning a little bit more about each of them in a minute or two. Uh, we in the National Park Service are committed to sharing their stories and ensuring that the more than four million people who come to this memorial each year understand that the America we know today and the blessings we enjoy as a free people were shaped by their deeds. As we look around this magnificent memorial, we notice numerous references to momentous events that occurred on the beaches of France three quarters of a century ago. From the bas relief of the June 6th landings to the simple word Normandy on the northern fountain to the FDR prayer plaque, to the Wall of Honor, where 25 of the gold stars represent the approximately 2,500 American servicemen killed under them. 
and immediately to my left, below the Atlantic Arch, is a quote from General Eisenhower, taken from his delivered remarks to the troops that would make the invasion. He said, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. Eighty years later, for the rest of time, these words ring just as true as they did on June 6th of 1944. Today, the eyes of a grateful world are upon you. We remain forever indebted to our veterans for their courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. Pleasure to welcome back to the mic, Jane Griffin. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Welcome to the magnificent World War II Memorial on this historic day for our nation and our allied nations around the globe. A special welcome to our World War II veterans. As we gather here 80 years later to commemorate day and the start of Operation Overhanger, the Battle of Normandy, we are honored to be joined by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's great-grandson, Elliot Toby Roosevelt, as well as representatives of the Allied Nations who stood side by side with the United States in the great effort to defeat tyranny and fascism. Thank you. I'm also honored to be joined by my honored colleagues, Superintendent Rangel, who we met, Mid Director Gibson, Chaplain Horton, Ron D. Elliott, and Alex Kershaw. Earlier, we had the privilege of hearing from Alex, the resident historian of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial. What a stirring and inspiring account of those first moments when Americans landed on Omaha Beach and began the march to liberate Europe. Alex has written some amazing books about World War II. It is crucial for all of us to listen to expert World War II storytellers like Alex and to our veterans' stories, which the Friends of the National World War II Memorial captures and archives on our website. It is important that we learn to be storytellers ourselves. The enduring impact of D-Day, along with the contributions of those who served both overseas and on the home front, must always be remembered. Equally important is that we remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice in this quest for freedom. Later, during this ceremony, you will hear from a gold star daughter, Rhonda Yelly, whose father was killed on D-Day. We must never forget the families left behind. Today, volunteers and members of the public are giving their time to read the names of nearly 9,000 Americans who were killed or remain missing during the Battle of Normandy and Operation Overlord, and who are memorialized in the Normandy American Cemetery. Over the course of approximately seven hours, we started at 5 a.m., and we'll continue with after the ceremony. These names are being read in front of FDR's three-day prayer plaque in the Circle of Remembrance, which is just outside the Atlantic Arch over there. It is said that a person dies twice, once when they take their final breath, and later the last time their name is spoken. The plaque contains the words of President Roosevelt as he beseeched all Americans to pray for the safety and success of our men and women in the armed forces and our allies who are embarking on this essential mission to free Europe. I invite you to take a short walk after this ceremony up to the Circle of Remembrance. You can read this prayer that President Roosevelt invited the whole country to read with him eight years ago tonight. Friends of the National World War II Memorial is proud to have led the effort to add this special prayer to the memorial, as well as to restore the circle of remembrance. Eighty years have passed since D-Day, 
but the legacy and lessons of that day and the days that follow remain vital to pass on to current and future generations. We must never forget the men and women who served and sacrificed to bring freedom to millions around the globe. Their remarkable efforts should inspire us in our own lives. Let us learn from their character, the values they represented, and the spirit of commonwealth, courage, service, and unity that they embodied. We must imbue these values into our own lives and ensure they are passed on to future generations so all may live up to the example set by the greatest generation. As we reflect on this day, let us come together, unify, and strive to embody the spirit of cooperation and determination that defined their generation. In doing so, we honor their memory and ensure their legacy continues to inspire and guide us. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. We are now honored to hear from Gold Star daughter, Rhonda Elliott, whose father was killed at Omaha Beach 80 years ago today. Ms. Gibson, Mrs. Dropa, Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Kershaw, Mr. Reinbold, Chaplain Horton, honored veterans, and anybody else who's important that I might have left out. It was very early in the morning, so early that even though the summer solstice was just two weeks away, the men on the boats, most of them a little more than boys, were exhausted. They had been up since before dawn the day before, with no rest in sight in the near future. Most likely what kept them awake was excitement about finally getting into the fight, and also anxiety over the fearful unknown which lay ahead. If you've ever been to the Normandy coast, you know that it can be very cold and windy there, even in the very early summer. And a huge storm had passed through the night before, making the water rougher than usual. In every account we hear and have heard about these men and their trip across the English Channel, we have been told that they were miserably seasick. With the sound of waves crashing against their boats on either side, each man was alone with his thoughts. The whole world was waiting for this day. At that moment, the place of the landings was still a well-kept secret. And I doubt if any of those men on the boats knew that they were part of history and indeed that they were going to participate in the most pivotal event of the 20th century. One of these young men was my 23-year-old father, Franklin Elliott. But he was hardly ever called that, and he was known to family and friends as Bud or Buddy. He arrived at 06.30 hours in the morning, H hour, by way of a landing craft made for tanks, because he was part of the five-man crew of a Sherman waiter tank scheduled to land in the first wave. But like most craft that day, they were blown off course, so I don't really know exactly where they landed. But their aim, their objective, was to land on the easy red sector. Their mission was to pave the way for the infantry who would come straight behind them and get ashore first. Still in the boat, my dad had taken his position as the tank gunner. The go order was given. The ramp came down, and the tank lurched forward, with waves kind of pushing it a little closer to the beach, when BAM! They were hit by a German gun, by a shell from a German gun, which was hidden within one of Hitler's bunk, concealed within the embankment behind the beach. 
The giant machine stopped, but only in chest deep water. This tank was supposed to have been their protection, and now the tank was out of commission, disabled and useless. You can imagine their thoughts. Oh my God, what do we do now? But since the tank was only in chest deep water, each of the men started climbing out one by one. One of them received an ugly wound to the leg. And I'm told my dad and another crew member helped him get to shore, and they took him as far up the beach as they could because the tide was coming in. Then they waited and hoped for a medic to come along soon. From that moment on, it went from chaos to catastrophe to calamity. And now the infantry troops were starting to land. In the midst of utter confusion, their only hope was to get across that beach and up the embankment on the other side. The tankers, who had suddenly become infantry, took weapons from the bodies of men who had already died, tried to help out where they could, and tried to move forward. Smoke and noise and the screams of the wounded were everywhere. A new crisis occurred every single minute as they saw friends and comrades being butchered before their eyes. They had to get off of that beach. This scene went on for hours, and we all know what those hours took in terms of human life. The movie was called The Longest Day for a reason. My father, my father sur survived the carnage for another 14 hours later hiding with his first sergeant among the brush about halfway up the embankment. And they were waiting for it to get darker. When it did, I'm told that my father moved forward first. He tripped a mine that had been planted there by Ronald's troops. The explosion instantly ended his life. What remained of his body, identified only by his dog tag, was buried in a temporary cemetery near the beach, and later, some years later, was moved to the newly created Normandy American Cemetery, situated on the bluff overlooking Omaha Beach and the English Channel. Now, this cemetery is a beautiful, beautiful place, but then it was a place of violence and mayhem. A lot of good men from a number of the Allied countries were killed on the D-Day landings. My father, I think, was one of those good men. He was a senior at Georgetown University right down the road here when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And like so many men and women across the nation, they stopped what they were doing. He and a friend left school and enthusiastically enlisted. He was what people call well-rounded. He was good at sports, and he was also good at academics. He was on uh, the football team. He lettered in football and won honors on the school's debate team. His plan for his future was to come home to my mother and me, to come back to Georgetown, finish college, enroll in the School of Foreign Service, and go on in that career. How different our lives would have been had any of those things happened. From the letters he wrote to my mom, I knew that he was a good and very patriotic, intelligent man. And probably, most important of all, or best of all, he had a sense of humor. And I learned that from reading his letters. And that endeared me to him right away, of course. He was in training in the United States when I was born and was killed on D-Day before I was two years old. I never heard his voice. I have no memory of him. To say that his absence was the most significant factor in my life would be a complete and honest truth. If I missed someone I never knew, then my mother missed him more. She went to work to support us and grieved him for the next 46 years when she died. She never remarried. He was her first and only love. I am standing here today, but I represent roughly 180,000 children who lost fathers in World War II. And if any of them were here, 
each of them would tell you a version of the same story. Today here in America, despite the internal problems we are facing, and which we have faced for the past 80 years, we enjoy more luxuries and advantages than any country in the history of the world. And it's a shame so many take them for granted. We owe these amazing advantages to the founders of our country, of course. But our freedoms have been continued and protected by those boys who entered Europe in 1944 and by those who fought in the Pacific. All of them returned as men. We also owe our freedoms to the thousands of soldiers who didn't return, who are buried in their hometowns or in national cemeteries across the United States and those whose remains lie under white marble crosses in Normandy, the Normandy American Cemetery, and 14 others across Europe, North Africa, and the Philippines. May we remember them. May we never forget what it took to win that war and always honor their lost young lives by working for the survival of our precious republic and our democratic way of life. Thank you. The Marine Brass Quintet will now perform a special tribute in honor of our World War II veterans. It is a great privilege to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Elliot Toby Roosevelt III, great-grandson of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Toby Roosevelt served as a fighter pilot with the United States Air Force and Air Force Reserve. He earned a bachelor's degree from Stanford University with honors and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. He now serves as the principal in his family's investment firm. I would like to thank 
the friends of the National World War II Memorial for inviting me to the ceremony today. I would also like to thank the audience for being here to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day. On June 6, 1944, I, of course, had not been born. My father was seven years old, and it is likely if he had not yet gone to bed on a ranch southwest of Fort Worth, Texas, he listened to his grandfather pray before the country that evening. Among its many legacies, the Normandy landings represent the delivery of humankind to a better world, where people reaffirmed at great cost the central ideas of human dignity, liberty, and the rule of law, the ideas upon which this country was founded. At a time when the outcome of the great contest to sustain those values hung in the balance, the President of the United States chose not to make a speech, but with the people of this nation to make a solemn request to the Almighty, a decision reflecting a world view defined by humble acknowledgement of the limits of man and of man's ultimate dependence upon a just, all-powerful, loving God. For those like me, who've always lived within the light of that war's transcendent outcome, it is all too common <clears throat> to never have grasped or to never have been taught the central character of World War II. The United States and its allies face a real, here and now today, existential threat. If we lost, we would live under the jackboot of Nazism. It was a fear those born later have never known. As such, FDR's D-Day prayer reminds us that the ideas which undergird our lives and which we take as givens are not givens at all that despite this country's great strengths, as an embodiment of those ideas, the United States remains a delicate experiment. One of the many wonderful aspects of our democratic capitalistic system is that no matter what each of us does, simply by working and by competing hard, each of us contributes to this country's vibrancy and strength. However, when compared to the sacrifices of the men who hit the beaches of France on that day, and others like them at different places during that war and in other wars, few of us have given much to merit the freedoms and protections we have enjoyed our entire lives. Freedoms and protections we love, freedoms and protections that we take for granted, and freedoms and protections which the vast majority throughout history have never known. When we were born, these were simply handed to us. At 3.32 a.m. Eastern Time, June 6, the invasion of Normandy was officially announced. As word spread in early morning, factory whistles blew, church bells rang, spontaneous gatherings took place, and throughout the day, churches and synagogues swelled as citizens took to me in prayer. That evening, the president went on the air. The White House had earlier distributed his prayer in order that the audience could pray alongside their commander-in-chief. An estimated 100 million Americans did so. And if you would excuse the lack of a turn-of-the-century Victorian accent, the following are his words. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at that moment that troops in the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and greater operation. It has come to pass with success thus far. And so, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set 
Success may not come with rushing steam, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sore tried by night and by day, without rest until the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. For these men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn, but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these father and receive them. Thy heroic servants into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, Almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuous prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our people. Give us strength to strengthen our daily tasks, to redouble the contributions we make in the physical and the material support of our armed forces. And let our hearts be stout to wait out the long travail, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage unto our sons, wheresoever they may be. And, O oh Lord, give us, give us faith in Thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dull. Let not the impacts of temporary events of temporal matters of a fleeting moment, let not these de deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will, shut, that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all of men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done. 
No one knew it yet. A new, much brighter day broke for generations, born and unborn, including a seven-year-old grandson growing up in Texas. As the author Rick Atkinson described, as the invasion fleet steamed east through the darkness for the waiting dawn, for this moment, Mother Nature set aside her famous indifference. Hallelujah, sang the sea. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To the World War II veterans here today, we are so lucky for you. May we now and in the future live up to your standard and live up to what you have conferred upon us. Now please welcome United States Mint Director Ventress Gibson, who will help us to honor our World War II veterans. And good morning to everyone. This is such a humbling experience to stand before you at the National World War II Memorial today. As we reflect on the victories, the sacrifices, and the valor of the greatest generation. And thank you to all of our nation veterans and to our distinguished guests that are here in attendance, to our Gold Star families. Your strength and your dedication serves to inspire us all continuously. To Ms. Elliott and to Mr. Roosevelt III, thank you for sharing your stories today because these stories not only preserve your family's legacy, but it preserves and articulates and clearly informs our nation's history. To our partners at the National Park Service and friends of the National World War II Memorial, thank you for hosting this event and for continuing to inform and share the lessons of yesterday so we can continue to grow and we can inform the next generation and generations of our history. As a proud Navy veteran, I understand the significance of service and the importance of never, never taking freedom for granted. Each star on the freedom wall and each beautiful wreath that we place today is a solemn reminder of the sacrifices that the greatest generation made to preserve and endure our freedom. No other generation in our nation's history came together to answer their nation's call in such a pivotal way. For me personally, I had three uncles who served in World War II, and they are not here with us anymore, but I remember the stories that they told us when we were children upon their return. The 2024 Greatest Generation Commemorative Coin, for which I represent the United States Mint today, uniquely honors the service and sacrifice of American service members and their civilian counterparts, as well as our allied countries during World War II. The coins in this program highlight an entire generation of brave Americans who stepped up to defend freedom and preserve democracy. Each coin shines a spotlight onto this beautiful memorial. And I can tell you that on behalf of the employees of the United States Mint, who not only designed these in collaboration with so many important people, but also take each coin that we produce and that we design and that we put out to everyone to appreciate. The passion is unrelenting. They have tireless efforts of excellence 
and for that I thank all of the Mint employees who brought these miniature canvases of art to you. And we have depictions of the coins to my right and to your left. The good news about the United States Mint and the gold, silver, and plaid coins that we showcase for this great memorial, that it is my honor that right now, the greatest generation coin commemorative coins are one of the best sellers for the U.S. Mint. And what does that mean for Friends of World War II Memorial? More than 60,000 coins have been purchased so far. Right now, the sales generated in surcharge, and a surcharge is what we give to the Friends of the Memorial, nearly $720,000 so far. And that is to help the National Park Service preserve this wonderful edifice. Those surcharges we awarded to them in support of to ensure that we maintain, safeguard, and repair this site. The coins can be purchased by you or anyone else interested at the usmint.gov website. I have to put that plug in because that's important so we can make sure we get them all sold. So on behalf of the United States Mint, on behalf of the great veterans that we serve, thank you and God bless America. So at this time, would you join us in honoring the following World War II veterans by presenting each with their own greatest generation commemorative coin. It is now my honor to introduce to you two very special World War II veterans. As the veterans' names are called, and they either stand or wave, Director Gibson will step forward to present them with a 2024 Greatest Generation Commemorative Coin. Coins are provided by friends of the National World War II Memorial as a token of our appreciation for their service. Now our World War II veterans. Enlisting in the Navy at age 18, Mr. James Elsner Barron served on LST-543 during Operation Overlord. On D-Day, LST-543 landed on Juneau Beach, carrying Canadian troops. Jim made numerous trips across the English Channel, caring for wounded soldiers. On June 16, 1944, LST landed on Omaha Beach delivering tanks, troops, and supplies. After a storm stranded the ship, it was repaired in Portsmouth and resumed resupply missions. Post-war, Jim used the GI Bill to earn a degree in chemical engineering and had a long career with the Atomic Energy Commission. Retired Army Colonel Frank Cohn was born in Breslau, Germany in 1925 and escaped to the United States with his parents at the age of 13. He was drafted into the U.S. Army and served in the Battle of the Bulge, the Rhineland and Central Europe campaigns, and met the Russians at the Elba River. He later served as Sergeant of the Guard for Nazi prisoners tried in the second Nuremberg trial. Colonel Cohn served in the military for a total of 35 years, including tour tours in Korea and Vietnam, before retiring from his role as Chief of Staff of the Military District of Washington. And with us in spirit are all of our World War II veterans, including our dear friend, the late Herman Sychek, who landed in the first wave on Utah Beach on D-Day. We are grateful to have Herman's family with us as we remember him and all our veterans. Please remain seated while we prepare for the official wreath laying at the Freedom Wall.
representing the United States of America, our Toby Roosevelt, Gold Star daughter, Rondi Elliott, and World War II veteran, Mr. James Barron. Representing the National Park Service, World War II veteran Colonel Frank Cohn, accompanied by National Mall and Memorial Park Superintendent Mr. Jeff Reinbold. Representing friends of the National World War II Memorial, our friends of the National World War II Memorial Chair, Mrs. Jane Dropa, Board Member, Retired Navy Rear Admiral John Vidoff, and friends, resident historian Alex Kershaw. Representing Australia is Naval Attaché Commodore David Frost. Representing Canada is Armed Forces Assistant Military Attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Martin Arcan. Representing the Czech Republic, is Defense Cooperation Attaché and Assistant Defense Military Naval and Air Attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Jan Novotny. <laughs> Representing Denmark, is Defense Attaché, Rear Admiral Jakob Rousseau. <laughs> Representing France, is Deputy Chief of Mission, Orle Bonal, and Naval Attaché Captain John Olivier Grau. <laughs> Representing Greece is Defense Attaché Brigadier General Panagiotis Lakopoulos. Representing the Netherlands is Military Attaché, Colonel Peter Neuvenhaus. <laughs> Rep 
representing Norway, Defense Attaché Major General Harold Hagen. Representing the Republic of Poland is Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. Adam Trubasadzki. <laughs> Representing all our allied nations, our United States Mint Director, Ms. Ventress Gibson, Maritime Administration, Deputy Associate Administrator for Commercial Sea Lift, Ms. Melinda Simmons Healy, and Chaplain Will Horton. Please rise for the playing of taps. Please be seated. We've now come to the part of the ceremony where we will play the service song. When you hear your service song being played, please stand and be recognized. State Army. Thank you. 
United States Navy. States Coast Guard. States Air Force. Space States Marine Corps. concludes today's ceremony. Thank you very much for attending. Today and every day, let us remember men and women of our greatest generation.